Dr. Schneider, she's a, a psycho-oncologist from James Hospital, and she's going to talk to us today about how to be kind to yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm from Lasher. Oh, that's okay. That's um, okay. So I'm a cancer psychologist in Lasher in the psychology department. Um, and so I guess my role is kind of meeting patients who are experiencing cancer and really sitting with how they're feeling about that. Because I guess it is a very holistic um, process to getting cancer. And often we forget that it's not just the physical. Of course, it's the emotional, the mental, the spiritual. So um, I'm here to kind of talk about self-kindness and compassion. Um, I'm aware that it's been a busy morning and the weather, of course, is always it's truly thankful. So I'm going to keep this quite short. I'm going to just do a practice because I think it's in practicing self-compassion that you can get a sense of what it really means. And um, I suppose just first to say, like often when I meet um, patients, there is an attitude that if you are compassionate to yourself when you show kindness, that you're then not fighting. Um, and I always have a real uh, discomfort with the word kind of fighting cancer, I suppose. There's been a lot of language um, used, which I think originated with Nixon and probably pharmaceuticals with fighting cancer, and that's all very well. But we don't want to take that responsibility as patients. Um, to try and fight something that's very much out of our control. Um, but maybe there's a mistake then sometimes with, well, if I'm kind to myself, I'll give up somehow. Whereas, and it's great to have the research and the evidence, when you're kind to yourself, um, it not only helps your overall well-being, but we're seeing that actually biologically helps as well with chromosomes as well. So um, not to get too much into the science, but... There is the evidence there, if you're definitely more someone who leads with your head, that this isn't buddy duddy it's not fluffy. And very much like what I wrote in the booklet that's outside, it's not just about buying yourself ice cream and getting into bed, which of course is lovely, and that is self-kindness. It's actually about being aware of how you treat yourself with your internal thoughts. So if you're constantly criticizing yourself, if you're constantly saying you should do better, if you have should in your vocabulary at all, I would say let it go. Leave it at the door and um, you're doing your best. And so try to just be aware, what is my internal language to myself? Do I support myself or do I kick myself when I'm down? Because often when we're suffering, of course, we don't want to feel it, painful emotions. We just want to move away from it. But just like you treat a friend or someone you loved, you wouldn't tell them, get on with it. And maybe sometimes we are told that in whatever experience we have in life. So let's just do a very brief um. I want to say meditation, but I know people often go, mm -hmm. <laughs> so let's just call it closing your eyes for a few moments and just really listening to these words and seeing how it resonates with you. So if you haven't heard of Kristen Neff, I would say, please look her up afterwards. And this is called a tender self-compassion break. And you can practice this and it's just five minutes. And if you can do this, once a day, amazing. If you can do it once a week, amazing. If you can do it just once and see how you feel, amazing. <laughs> And maybe take in a breath, breathing in through your nose and exhaling through your mouth. And letting your breath just anchor you and connect you to this feeling or these thoughts.
And now we're going to bring in the three components of self-compassion, starting with mindfulness. And please don't let that disrupt any thoughts that you have. Mindfulness might be a little bit of a buzzword, but really it's just a tender acceptance of being present with what is. Just as you are, just right now. So being present and validating any distress or pain. Maybe noticing if there is a sense of self-critical judgment coming in. And transforming that voice into something that sounds a little softer. Something like, this is hard to feel right now. This is painful. This is a moment of suffering. Moving on to reminding yourself of your humanity. Feelings like this. Situations like this, this is part of being human. There's nothing wrong with me for feeling this way. And I'm certainly not the only one. So allowing yourself to feel your connectedness to others. And knowing that at some time we all suffer. And connecting again with your breath, just if you're finding either your mind is running away or it's coming in with self criticism, letting your breath be your anchor, breathing in. And again, exhaling out. And finally, we want to bring in some kindness. The one way to do that is with physical touch. So I just invite you now to maybe lift your right hand and place it over your heart. And just letting it rest maybe on your chest in the way that sometimes it would be kind arm around a shoulder of someone or a hug to someone else when we want to reduce their suffering. and saying something kind to yourself, which is exactly what you need to hear in this moment. Maybe it's a message of, it's okay. I'm here for you. And if you weren't sure what you say, you would say to yourself, maybe imagine what you might say to a dear friend. What words of care and comforting would you use to help your friend? And then try to say something similar to yourself. Sometimes I say, think of a nickname for you, something that brings a smile to your face, that even when you hear it, you know it has a loving connotation. Whether it's an abbreviation of your name, a word like darling, pet, or love. And imagine using that now to talk to yourself. It's okay, pet. Or this is hard. I'm here for you, darling. And again, back to the breath. Maybe one last breath in. And exhale. And now letting this practice go, just allow yourself to be exactly as you are in this moment. When you're ready, you can open your eyes and move around or stretch. And if you didn't feel anything in that and you found it a struggle, 
that's okay. We don't tend to allow ourselves to meet our suffering. And as I said, of course not. It's painful. We want to move away from it. But even if you give yourself those five minutes of just recognizing where you're at, it will be amazing in terms of your well-being, but it really will transform how you journey throughout life, not just now, but generally. And just to say, if you find that in any way emotional or it touched on anything, that that's okay too, of course. You probably got in touch with some elements of pain or suffering. And by acknowledging it, we're just allowing it come in, and then we're just allowing it pass too. So sorry it's rushed. I'm so glad to be here. And um, there's some leaflets outside. I don't know if you're a master patient or if you'd like to take part in any of the groups. But there's some info outside if you'd like to take part in a compassionate group that I do online. So it's very easy to access. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. And of course, thank you always to the Reheating Foundation. See you soon. Hello, everyone. Um, Hugely important, um, and we've seen how much best uh, how the treatment has changed, and and this is probably changing a lot. You know, more and more and more. And the the treatment um, pathway for all breast patients, our breast cancer patients. So, um, Mr. Jamie Moran Smith, he's a consultant plastic surgeon in Beaumont Hospital. He's a special interest in DIY breast reconstruction, and he's going to do the next talk. And um, I think he, he Beaumont a couple of years ago. So he's um he's um. Well, <laughs> 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 Right. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good start. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. Great. Thank you. Sorry. Um, uh, so thanks for the introduction. Um, thank you for the invite today. Um, thanks for reheating for putting it on and making such an effort to make it all work. Uh, and thanks to the other speakers and more importantly, thanks to the patients themselves who are speaking to you and meeting you and giving you all the information, which is probably more valid than we, than we give you. Um, just a quick thing, all my pictures are all my own patients or, you know, their patients, the pictures that I've taken and I have their consent to show, but I don't have consent for anyone's picture on here. So that's quite important. So cancer reconstruction is in, in plastic surgery, it's classically, there's a big hole and we need to fill it with a reconstruction. And elsewhere in the body, the objectives are just to close the defect and restore the function. And then the third thing on the list is to maintain or restore the cosmesis of the area. And that's so at odds with breast cancer surgery because during a mastectomy, the objective is to remove the cancer, remove the high risk tissue in its production. And the objective then after that is a rapid healing and rapid progression to chemo or radiotherapy or whatever else is needed to improve uh, the percentage chances. Um, and that's just totally at odds with other reconstructions because when we do you know, a breast cancer reconstruction, it doesn't involve the first two. And all, all we're doing is um, maintaining or restoring cosmesis. 
Um, I'll touch on that a little bit later on why that's so important. It's a safe thing to do. So for many, many years, it was we had to push it and push it and push it with the breast surgeons that it was a safe thing to do. It's a really large UK study in 2015 saying that, yeah, sure, there's um, complications, but there's complications in all aspects, even if you have no reconstruction. Complications in implants and there's certainly complications with the FBAPs. But it happens in all patients, even if you go the simplest route of mastectomy alone. So we know it's going to happen. And we know that there are increased complications if you do a reconstruction. But this time to your further yeah, treatments like chemotherapy and radiotherapy wasn't significantly increased in this two and a half thousand patients. And it's kind of a, a stick that I use in Beaumont to try and push our breast surgeons to refer me more and more high risk patients. And I would say that while everyone should be offered a breast reconstruction, there are a cohort of people that have too advanced uh, an illness that we should be, you know, trying to go for something really simple, treat the cancer, and we can always do a delayed reconstruction. And while I'm happy to meet those people and chat to them, I still would sometimes say a delayed reconstruction is best. So it, it, it's an aesthetic operation. It's purely cosmetic in terms of the physical, the form. But function derives from form, and so there's a huge emotional, emotional and psychological uh, part of breast reconstruction. And that's really important. So we're not putting back to back together a leg that needs a flap to get it to close, and we're not doing something that restores function because you know we don't restore any function. But it's just so important from the very you know final part, which is the emotional and psychological. An important thing to remember is that breast cancer incidence is rising slowly, and in situ disease pickup is also rising. That's the blue line of the red line. And then the dotted line is cure rates showing that we're getting better and better outcomes. And then we're also seeing that you know the, the highest age brackets are in around the 50s. And what that means, we're getting increased number of infected women, affected women, increasing numbers of low-risk disease, and therefore we just have lots and lots of survivors who go on to live normal, happy lives, and therefore the reconstructions should be offered and they should be of a really high standard and they should last a long time. The gold standard of breast reconstruction, I would um, kind of disagree on, on this. It's nothing to do with us. So everyone has a different idea of what a gold standard. A gold standard could be, um, you know, getting back into the office two days later, getting back um, to kids to school a week later. That could be the gold standard of your treatment. The gold standard is not necessarily the aesthetic outcome. While there's a huge range of options, it's definitely you've got to pick what's best for you. And what's best for you is the gold standard as long as you've been offered everything. It, it, it's kind of a repeat of what Rob said, individual reconstruction of the patient's wishes. And I always make most people, when I see them for an immediate reconstruction, I say to them, you know, we have to acknowledge here that we're taking on risk. You know, an immediate reconstruction involves complications and problems and things that we have to sort of go through on a journey. And if they want the quickest and easiest way through the hospital, it's a simple mastectomy. I and mean, make patients kind of say, when they walk in the door and some of them say, you know, I just want something really simple. I want to get through this and be done with it. And I make them acknowledge, well, if you want something really simple, that's a mastectomy. And we say goodbye and we say, say hello again in two years' time. And then everyone realizes that, okay, you know, they are willing to take on a bit of risk. And then it's just a risk stratification, how much risk they want to take on and how much effort they want to put in terms of sacrifices. So I think that's a really, thing to, really important thing to ask yourself or to be asked at the start of the journey of immediate reconstruction. And then it's a patient choice. The outcomes, as I'm going to say later, are, depend on a huge amount of things. And lastly, in any other cancer, bowel cancer, lung cancer, all these things, all your data gets put into the MDT decision-making thing where all the doctors and uh, healthcare professionals sit down and talk about the best course of action. There's no other cancer where you get sat down and say, well, what do you want? And it, 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 it's unfortunately coming at a time you can tell me your breast cancer, you can tell me your blood scans, your waiting results of maybe your armpits, if you don't have to chemo, and suddenly someone's asking this huge question. Um, and so we kind of have to guide you, but yeah, it, it's also important to realize that this is a unique situation to be in. There's no other framework and other cancers for it. Just a few little sort of, before I start talking about the immediate is at the time of reconstruction, the benefit is you get to keep all your own skin. You do it all at one stage. Some, can, some skin, like in this lady, has to be taken out because the tumor is attached to it. Um, but you usually get less scars on, on the breast and you usually get a more natural outcome. You can potentially preserve the nip. And then the delayed reconstruction is after everything is done. Once you're out the far side, chemo, radio, everything's done, 
You've got the clear bill of health from your breast surgeon who's looking after your health, as opposed to me who's looking after your shape and appearance, your health. Your breast surgeon said, we're all happy, good to go, reconstruct. And that's a, it's kind of a more predictable pathway to delay the reconstruction in some ways. And then we talk about flaps. You'll hear the word flap the whole time. And a flap is basically any unit of tissue in your body that picked up and lifted to another site. And that can either be like the back flap, which is picked up and lifted around the front, but it still stays connected, or the tummy flap, the DF flap, which is a free flap. You disconnect the blood supply and you reconnect it somewhere else. So when you hear about flap, it's just a unit of your own tissue. And it's different to a graft. Some people get skin grafts when you're older for spatial skin cancer things. And that's just lifting with a skin and hoping it survives the transfer. And so essentially, you have a donor site, disconnect a lump of tissue, disconnect on that one artery and one vein. Remember, you have hundreds of millions of arteries and veins connecting these tissues. But we know from anatomical study things that it works. You disconnect it on one. And then you plug it in somewhere else. And that's classically the tummy plugging into the breast. And then the last kind of overview slide is just autologous reconstruction, which is this phrase we use for using your own tissue. It, 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 you know, it's going to give the best outcome in terms of longevity and shape and things like that, but that's not for everyone. It's important to say that things have moved on and we're not trying to create just a breast mount. And it, it's a simple thing to create a simple breast mount that, you know, is inside the skin and looks asymmetric and doesn't look right. That is sometimes the outcome, but that's not the objective. An objective and outcome have to be separated. And we should always have the objective of being able to create a symmetrical breast. Autologous reconstruction, use your own tissue, is for life. So once you do it, you generally do a few adjustments in a second procedure, and then it ages and it droops and it changes and it changes the other breast, hopefully for life. It used to be that the X and all these free flaps, it came with the proviso of, well, what if we go through all this and what it fails? And I guess over the last five years, things have excelled massively in terms of this. You know, we expect it to be, you know, work. It shouldn't not work unless it's like a Swiss cheese model where all things align to go wrong. And it still happens and it happens to all of us. And it's, you know, devastating, you know, for me and the patient, more so for the patient, but it's, it's taken pretty hard by the surgeon that does it as well. It's not, it's not like a simple thing to go wrong. Um, but now that it's working, we, we work on so many other things to make this a valid option. We're trying to make it much quicker, okay? The gone are the days where we're planning like a 10, 12 hour procedure. We're trying to make it really fast, significant. Two consultants working on the case, speed it up, things like that. We're trying to reduce donor site morbidity in terms of pain and scars and things like this. And then we're really working on early recovery to get you back to what you should be doing. And all, all of this is changed, it's hugely. There's loads of data on you know, autologous and using your own tissue just being better long term outcomes. And JAMA is the big American paper, German American surgery, uh, looking at, at two years post reconstruction. And it showed pretty significantly that. Autologous reconstruction in two years is a much happier outcome. It did show, though, that patients were less happy with their abdomen. So while we think it's a tummy tuck that we're using for the breast, there was a higher percentage of people that were dissatisfied with their tummy after the DF lab. And so I don't sell it as like a free tummy tuck if you're making, making you know, breasts. It's got to be this idea of sacrifice. And so this, essentially, I talk about the personal calls. Anyone who's had a consultation with me, I talk about the sacrifice and what's involved in the decision for you. And it, you have to decide, and if, if we're talking about your own tissue being the best reconstruction, we have to decide how much you want to put into it. Because I think most people are suitable personally uh, for a DM flap or for tie flaps or something. But some people just, you know, the most important thing is to get out of the hospital quick and to get a nice reconstruction that fits properly in clothes that nobody will ever know. You're out of hospital if you live, you know, in work, at the office, doing the kids, back at home. And for, for you know, that, that's infants. There's no fees, no personal fees, no emotional fees. It comes off the shelf and it goes, you're not sacrificing. If you have a tummy with a C-section scar and it hangs down, and it, it's something you've always hated about your tummy, you know, whatever, then it's not as big a sacrifice. So I'm seeing something you don't want. But if you're someone who's gone to the gym religiously, and you've got a really skinny tummy, I can still probably get a breast off of the tummy, but it's a much bigger sacrifice. And again, it just shows the individual, how individuals are all different. And then, you know, what some people see is a, a cost and a benefit that other people see differently. 
And so, you know, when I look at this, I see a deflated expander in her left breast, and I see something that I think just looks terrible. And I, I look at the one when I change it out and put a gel flap in on the right, I think that looks amazing, and I think it looks great. And she goes to my wife, and I just go, oh my God, that scar is just awful. And that's all she could see. And it's just so funny. And I think as breasts are, as reconstructive surgery, we get so preoccupied with the breast that you kind of forget that it's not really up to us. Um, the DF flap, in a nutshell, in a nutshell, you're basically taking tummy around the belly button underneath, disking out here for blood vessels, and you leave the muscle behind. You stitch it down at the bottom. You pull the belly button out through your hole. The DF flap goes inside the breast skin. You take away all the skin from the tummy, but keep it flat, and you just leave a little disc of skin to replace the nipple or whatever bit of skin has been taken away. And in a nutshell, that's you know your five hour procedure condensed to. 30 seconds. <laughs> I get all my, I, I email that to all my patients. I think, you know, as long as you know that, you know, you're actually your uh, And then we talk about the complications. Yeah, it, it's funny, it's quite a simple concept. Yeah, we've evolved from we've evolved from using the muscle. So this is your thick back muscle. It used to be that the blood vessels come through the muscle, it's easy, chop it a muscle, it's big blood vessels, parts of the muscle, so it's very easy. But now we have to work through the muscle, we leave the muscle behind, the muscle behind. We're taking out you know vessels that are so, so one millimeter at times. And that's where it's tricky and that's where it's difficult going through the muscle. But the idea is that we're not taking any muscle. And so if we get quick and if we get really good at it, the idea for me of taking a back muscle is of secondary, is, is not as good as taking the tummy. The tummy is fat, I'm not taking any muscle. Your core strength is proven to be the same afterwards. Um, and so that's the advantage of it and that's the evolution of, uh, of breast reconstruction. And you can aim for near perfect reconstructed reconstruct results. So this is, I don't know, this is she's still got her brown tape on, so she's probably only about six weeks post op. And she's, you know, that's her breast for life. It's gonna hang and it's gonna give her tosis. She's not had her nipple done yet, it's much too early for that. She could scar around the belly button still if you but you can just aim for these really super results. And again, this is another one that I showed my wife to her, she's like, oh my god, a nipple is way too high. And I look at it and think, God, I've done a great job. <laughs> And it's funny, you do get caught up in the, the nuances of the technical aspects. You know, I did a great job connecting those tiny blood vessels. And it really doesn't matter if it looks like, uh, if it looks bad. I do think, however, this is still a good reconstruction. I, I showed this, and I, I'd be very proud, I am very proud of that as a reconstruction. Uh, but it, you know, you lose track of some things. And then a delayed reconstruction is, um, so it's different. So you've got to take a lot of the tummy skin. So instead of expanding skin with the expander, I need a lot of the tummy skin. So this lady had a delayed reconstruction. That's her about, I suspect, a year and a half. She's had her nipple reconstruction, but not her tattooing. She's probably due to see ashing in the near future. You can see when I planned it, I planned to do a reduction. That's a pattern of a reduction type lift on the other breast. But then when I when I did the flap and it settled in, it settled in such a nice shape. And I can't remember, but usually I have a pre op discussion about what the patient wants. So first thing I ask the patient walks in, what do you think your other breast? And they say, great, then I try to match it. If they're like, you know, I hate my other breast, what can we do with that? Then we just try and make something we want. And in this case, I think she was ambivalent. So when I got in good shape on the other side, I left it. But you can see, I probably didn't show her scar on the tummy properly, but you can get good results, but it's not quite the same. The, the sort of, the figures of the air flaps, there's about one to 200 grade of loss. And it, we should be all aiming for that. I think we all do aim for that. Four percent return to rate and return to theater. So I tell everyone I used the, the, the two figure one in 200 failure, one in 20 return to theater, and one in two rate of any complications. About one in 100 that part of the black won't survive. It looks pretty gnarly, but it heals up eventually. And then I show everyone what an amendment looks like a few weeks afterwards because it's a pretty gnarly picture again. And it looks bad, but I have to I make everyone see it. Because everyone then gets through it, they see it, and they're like, okay, fine, dressings for a few weeks. And I said it's nearly one and two, you get some sort of extended dressings on the album. And they all heal and they do really well. But I, I guess the consent process is if you know that this is the bump of the road that's coming, the wound problems, it's much easier to take. It's a longer recovery than the other reconstruction. So, you know, we're down to, you know, three to four days in the inpatient. I make people do two weeks of full recovery mode, but you're just actively recovering. So you're just pottering about the house, just trying to let everything recover, get the energy back. Six weeks of no straining, no lifting. I generally tell my patients to draw in about three weeks, uh, and I said they can work from six to eight weeks. So that depends massively. If you have your own company that's 
and your your family is you know relying on you to make money, people are back in work way early, back on the laptops, the big trees. And if you're in a job that pays six weeks, you put sick leave, you're off for you know eight, 10, 12 weeks, depending on you know where you are, stay away the things in terms of being next treatment. Mean, so that's all very variable. Full recovery, I'd say full energy about three months. That's very give or take. And then the abdominal feels as normal as it can be because it's always different at about 12 months. It's hard to give exact figures on that. It's pretty intense procedure. So this is everyone in theater. So have that. So, uh, you know, there's two breast surgeons, a few plastic surgeons, two nurses, microscope in the corner, instruments strewn all around the theater. And it, it's a pretty intense operation and it, it's become streamlined. Uh, but it's still, it, it's it's quite a lot of um, resources to pack into one room. And so it, it, it's hard to make sure it's available for everyone at every time. Uh, but that's the objective of, of days like today. Implant restructuring is the most commonly performed procedure. And it's consistently, even though we're getting good at dips, it's still consistently increasing its percentage along with the increase of people who are having mastectomies, et cetera. And the reason being is it's faster, it works on slim patients, there's no donor site, so it, you, know, you don't have to worry about the sacrifice. Fast recovery, potentially an easier, easier patient decision when you're told you've got breast cancer, you just, it's an easier decision. You know there's no sacrifice, okay, let's do that. And, and there's a concern about expertise available. And so I see this as the target. And what, what can I target here to make my operation better, to make people have a you know better chance of having a better reconstruction as I see it? And so we, we talk about operative speed. And so standards, you know, immediate is four to five hours and because you've got to let the breast surgeons in and out as well. Standard delay is about three or four, and standard bilateral is five to six. On the caveat that bilateral is you're using both sides of the tummy. And so you can't make any mistakes. And if you do make a mistake, you can't just go to the other side of the tummy to take the blood vessel. So if I mess up, I'll spend a couple of hours fixing the vessels under the scope. And so while I say five, six hours, that's the one that can just extend massively because you have no backup on the other side. Um, so Rob well, touched on this. I just want to show some of you just the technical side of things that you don't need to know anything about medicine to understand this. So this maybe that's her album. And this little divot here is her belly button. These two little white lines, instead of blood vessels coming out into the fat, coming through the muscle. And so I can either, if I need a breast, I can take off, can you see my line? No. Um, yeah. yeah. So about that is what I need for a breast. So a little bit over halfway. So usually that's what I'm taking. I can either take that or I can take this one. So I get to choose either blood vessel. And the idea of CT is I can choose it pre-op. And so looking at those two blood vessels, they look the same, pretty happy with them. But when I go to the next slide, you can see that this one, the little white dot, that wraps around your, your six pack muscle, and the other one's going straight through it. And so I'll probably cut off an hour's worth of time if I choose this one, the right side. And I'm also not going to damage any muscle. So that's why CT has just changed things massively. So I want every one of my patients has a CT beforehand. I tell them it's not your, your cancer scan, it's just literally a map. Map of your blood vessels, help you take the right one, help you, help you get through it quicker. Slim patients, I do lots of white pedicle flaps. So, on slim patients who don't have enough tissue, I basically connect one vessel to the other and then connect them into the breast. Um, you can do multiple flaps into one breast. You can do alternative donors like the thighs. Next gap, eye gap, I've never done one. I don't think I ever will. Everyone I talk to says it's kind of crappy fat in that it's really thick and hard and bumpy and it kind of doesn't make a nice breast. And then lap flaps are just really tough. They're the, the, the little handles that we all have that they just come with a tiny vessel and it's really different microsurgery. And I don't think I'll ever have the throughput to, you know, consistently tell someone like a new lap flap that work every time. But you know, you can do a DF on everyone. So when I talk about sacrifice, this lady sacrificed a really kind of perfect abdomen for a less perfect abdomen. And her benefit is, you know, she's got a normal takeoff here. So there's no implant, no size implant that you could put into her that she would have a symmetrical chest. And she, 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 you know, she needs her nipple tattooed a little bit lower to make it symmetrical. And actually, when I did her adjustments, I don't show it there. She's a little bit, you know, lack of definition here. The things with the depth, you can always adjust. Implants are hard, but harder to adjust to perfection, near perfection. And then we can re refine our morbidities. We can do smaller and smaller incisions, take that blood vessel out through the muscle. We can use it sort of advanced wound management techniques such as closed suction drains over the top of your wound to help it heal if you're someone with a higher chance of wound problems. Long acting air blocks, trying to get you through the first light, reducing metamorphin use. Drain fluid management, you can try to avoid drains. So, a lot of the you know, abdominal plasties you'll see drainless. 
Honestly, I, I tried it for a while and I'm just not convinced it works and my patients are in for more days anyway. And so I've gone back to using drains. But these are all the things we're trying to do to increase you know, the availability of the FBAPs. So to go back to this, the last one I just mentioned is the salvage reconstruction. So someone who's got an implant in, it's always an option to use your abdomen if you haven't had previous significant surgery. So I, I don't mean like C-sections, oophorectomies, you know, penisectomies, all those people can have a DM flap. If you have a previous liposuction, you can still have a DM flap. And I've done maybe three previous liposuction patients who've had a successful DM flap with no problems. You can't have it if, you, if you've had a tummy tuck. I think that's it. If you have a really bad one, so there's big lumps everywhere, you probably can't have it up turns up there for that. But pretty much everyone is technically a candidate for a DF flap until you meet, say, me, Richie, or Rob, or whatever. So a yeah, breast surgeon, you look at your tummy, and with all due respect, they don't know. Okay, so I'm just adding that in. And so you can see she said, you know, she's in a reconstruction that's constricted in radiotherapy. And all of a sudden, I'll point out the nipple on this side, that's actually Marion's nipple. Uh, so she's outside, she does amazing work. But you can see how much happier and healthier everything looks. She goes on to have a, you know, uh, she'll go on and have a normal life, never touch her breasts again. Final thoughts, everyone's different. Size, shape, personal voices. It's not up to me, it's decided it's up to me to give you all the options. And if I can't give you all the options, it's up to me to give you my options and put you in touch with someone who can give you the other options. One size doesn't fit all. So uh, it's got to be tailored, as Rob said. Surgeons are biased, okay? Everyone in this room is biased. We all have intricate, you know, uh, brains that have these biases. And so when I see a patient, I'm always looking for a way to get enough tissue to make a breast. And you'll see from Katrina speaking, you get really good at results with implants. Also, I do implants as well. And, I, you know, I talk to patients and sometimes an implant is just a way forward. It's a simple, quick operation and knowing that we can always go back and put your own tissue in at a later date if that's a better option. The objective in an immediate, I try to tell my patients, is that I'm trying to get perfect symmetry back. I'm trying to go for a completely disguised reconstruction of the law and a nipple tattoo. And that's the idea. It's the objective, it's not the outcome. That's what I'm trying to. And in the delayed, what I tell the women is I'd love to be able for you to wear an unsupported strength so you get the total local tunnel and you're not worried about what's moving where. And you know, that's my objective. Final one is the surgeons are biased. And so we all have these things, and, and, and my classic one is. So my, my, my eldest child, when she was a baby, I was convinced she was better looking than all the other babies. Like, I'm really convinced of it. Yeah. And then you go back to your, when you picture your phone, you see these pictures and you're like, okay, maybe not quite so much. So you, you just need to be aware of that. So when you meet someone, you just need to make sure you're aligned with their thoughts. Because there's no way to overcome bias. It's been shown in research and everything like that. So you just need to be aware of your options and be an advocate for yourself. Thanks very much. So that's great. Um, so one size is a great take on message um, and the bias, of course. So um, a great pleasure to um, introduce Katrina Lawler. She's a consultant plastic surgeon in Vincent's um, hospital. She um, has a, a, the insight because she would have worked with um, Mitchell Brown in Toronto, the, the, the founder of the Brad Day. So she did her fellowship across there. And I think that she set up the first Brad Day in the Vincent's group um, a long time ago. Oh, that's what I mean. A long time ago. So Katrina's going to talk about implant-based reconstruction with ADM. Thanks. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for the invitation. I'm, I'm the implant. I actually saw it could be a girl and it was probably me. So implants are not the worst thing in the world. And as uh, Jamie was saying, we are still seeing lots and lots of reconstructions with implants, but we're also seeing lots and lots of reconstructions. And this is one of my proudest things that I can show you is that over the last number of years, we have we looked at this in 2019 and shown the increased number of reconstructions that we're seeing in our hospital. And so you can see that every year we're seeing more and more people being reconstructed. And these are all immediate reconstructions. So this is something that's very positive in terms of the fact that we're seeing more and more people getting the opportunity to be reconstructed. I think that's really good. And then this just looked at the different types of reconstructions. And the green lines that you can see, hopefully, 
um, do show that we're seeing more and more in flat reconstructions. We're seeing less of the back flat reconstructions, and then there are other, obviously, the DF flat is increasing in our hospital as well. But it is nice to see that the, the implant reconstructions are becoming more and more common. As Jamie said, people do choose and they have to choose for a reason. And I think that there's certainly a, there is a person who, who wants and needs an implant based reconstruction. And some of those people are just, you need to get back to your life. And you need to get back to your life quickly. Um, so the people that want implant based reconstructions tend to be people who want to get back to their normal life as fast as possible and obviously restore their body image as soon as we can do that. Now this, I don't expect you to read, but when I started in business, there was one option for implant-based reconstruction. Everybody got the tissue expander, and that was it. Whereas now we have lots and lots of different ways to put implants in, and we also have lots and lots of different ways to manage the overlying skin. And so it's exciting and interesting for me to see all the different things that we can and have available to, I can do now for patients that we didn't have available 18 years ago. The biggest thing to know about implants is you need something to cover them. I intuitively, we all think take the breast out of the implant in the gut. It would be nice if that was the case, but you tend to use something to cover that implant underneath the skin to make it less visible, less palpable, and less prone to infection. And we've used various things over the years. The, probably the most common thing we used for a long time was using the pectoralis muscle. So that's the muscle that's on the chest wall that looks really thick. And if you think of a bodybuilder, they look like they have a breast, that's the muscle. Um, we've also used a lateral chest wall muscle called the serratus, some of the fascia overlying the rectus muscle. And now in the last number of years, we've used what's called ADM, and I'll explain a little bit more about that, synthetic meshes. And sometimes we even use a little bit of the lower part of your own breast skin to actually help us cover the implant. And this is that muscle I was telling you about, the pectoralis major muscle. This was the workhorse for an awfully long time in terms of what we could use to help us cover the implant and protect it. So in terms of how we do the implant-based reconstructions, primarily for, originally we used, always used a tissue expander, which is effectively an empty balloon. And that empty balloon would go in underneath the muscle and that would create a pocket. We still sometimes use uh, tissue expanders, but it's not as common anymore. And the most common reasons we use tissue expanders now is in patients who are smokers or who have been previously radiated. We tend to avoid using tissue expanders now, and we've moved more to going directly to implant and trying to get a result much more quickly. So effectively, this just shows a little picture of what we used to do. So we tend to, in the, in the past, put in a tissue expander, which is on the, the left-hand side, which is an empty balloon underneath the muscle. We would, the reason we did that was it it's, it's, a, it's an anatomic space. There just wasn't enough room for an implant. So what we would do is put a tissue expander in. We would, over a period of time, stretch that to create a pocket and then ultimately put a permanent implant in. The advantages of that obviously were it was relatively simple. We don't have a big scar anywhere else in the body. And it did create a predictable shape. The problem with that shape was it tends to be really very much the shape of the implant. And unfortunately, the other breast didn't look like an implant and it became a problem. So it was very hard to try and create the shape of the pocket to give us what's called ptosis or to the other breast. We also found that there was a lot of negative effects of radiation on both the muscle and the implant itself. Primarily, the biggest problem is you develop something called capsular contracture. Capsular contracture is a hardness that can form around your implant, which can ultimately result in pain and distortion. And so those are two things nobody wants and can result in multiple surgeries and operations over time. And so we were, we've always worked in trying to use the implants and find ways to deal with capsular contractor to make it less likely to require surgery in the future. The other problem with this was obviously that it was in more than one stage, it required multiple visits, and it was really a process more than an actual immediate reconstruction. So in 2010, we did the first ADM reconstruction in our what ADM is, it's, a, it's called acellular gerbil matrix. It's a surgical mesh that's derived from some sort of skin. Primarily in Europe, we use animal skin, so either porcine or bovine. In North America, they do have cadaveric or human skin that is available, but that's not present in Europe. Um, it's a mesh of collagen matrix, so it's a layer, a lattice of collagen matrix. And what happens is your own little cells actually grow into it and it becomes part of it. So in this case, uh, or I'll show you, do we have a pointer? 
So effectively what happens, so effectively what happens is we cut the edge of the pectoralis major muscle. And so we use the pectoralis major muscle in the upper part of the breast to cover the implant. And we use the ADM in the lower part of the breast. And this is what's called a sub pectoral direct implant reconstruction. We started doing these in 2010. The big advantage of this, and if you look to the, to the diagram, you can see that there's the skin and the fat underneath the skin, and then you have the muscle in the upper pole and the ADM in the lower pole. So similar advantages in that there's no additional scars anywhere else in your breast. There's no large second surgery that's required. We did find that we got much better ptosis. So if you take something that's round, you make it flat, try and make it round again, it's never going to be the same. But if you keep it round, it's more likely to look like the other breast. From a psychological point of view, obviously going to sleep, waking up and wearing a bra and having cleavage makes a huge difference. It's going to make us all feel better. And we're definitely seeing, we definitely saw improvements in capsular contracture rates, especially in radiated patients. So patients were not having as much long-term problems. They weren't requiring as many secondary surgeries, and they weren't having as much distortion as a result of radiotherapy. Big disadvantages are related to the, using it under the muscle is that you sometimes, when you cut the muscle, you move your arm, the implant. It's called animation. Sometimes it bites you, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it's bad, sometimes it isn't. But it's not very nice. Actually, cutting the muscle causes additional pain. And we were still seeing some of the negative effects of radiation on the muscle. So when you radiate the muscle, it'll scar and it'll pull the implant up your chest. And so we were seeing, seeing that happen. And as a result, we were requiring secondary surgeries to release the capsular contracture and using fat or something to try and improve things. So this is just some examples of some of the patients that have had subpectoral direct implant breast reconstruction. So all of these women have skin, then fat, then muscle in the upper pole, and the ADM in the lower pole. And you can see we can get reasonably good symmetry between the two sides with respect to ptosis and in terms of once they have their, their nipples tattooed, they're going to be fairly reasonably matched. The upper, the upper one has actually been radiated already, so you can see that, they're toler that they've tolerated the radiotherapy quite well. And this is an example of a patient who was done very early on who had a non-nipple sparing surgery in the subvectoral position, and she's had her tattoos and she has good symmetry between her two breasts. The other thing, just to give you an idea of what else we can do in these situations, is we can actually use a wise pattern, which is effectively a skin reduction way. Of, it's effectively using what's called a mastopexy scar to lift the breast and also use that to make the breast smaller and then place an implant underneath. And certainly if you don't have breasts you like, certainly we can often use this way of, of reconstruction to place the implant under the muscle and then give you a better shape. Free pectoral breast reconstruction is something that we've driven to, or we've been using for since 2018. And this is really the way forward, I think, in most places in the world. Effectively, we create a burrito pocket, we name it, we, everyone has a different name. Where ours is a burrito, but I know everyone has a different name. And what we do is we cover the entire, certainly anterior surface, with the ADM, and then place the implant inside. The big thing about that is, so what you're seeing is you have skin, then you have fat, then you have ADM, and you have your implant. We don't lift the muscle, and we don't affect the muscle. So again, similar advantages. It's simple. You have no additional scars. You definitely see better ptosis or droop, better matching to the other breast. It's a much more rapid recovery because you're not cutting the muscle, so you don't see as much pain. Definitely don't have animation. And we're definitely now, over time, keeping track of these patients, seeing less changes with radiotherapy. You're not worried about the muscle scarring and pulling the implant up over time. And we're definitely, because we have the entire implant covered in ADM, seeing less problems with capsular contracture. <clears throat> the biggest problems we are seeing is because the implant is closer to the surface of the skin and we have less coverage over top of it, we probably see more visibility, I should say, rippling, as in you can feel a little bit of the implant underneath, and also you can feel the edges. And those are things that we tend to deal with using fat injection most commonly, where we type fat using liposuction and inject underneath the skin, and those are done as secondary procedures. So just to give you an idea on the, the, the picture of a normal breast, putting the implant in a pre-pectoral position is in fact the most natural position. Your normal breast sits in front of your pectoralis major muscle, and so does the pre-pectoral implant. Putting it below the muscle is probably the least natural position because we're not supposed to have our muscles sitting over top of the breast. 
test. And this is just some examples of patients have done with nipple sparing reconstruction reconstructions in the prepectoral position. The upper one has a scar at the mammary fold, which you can't see. The other lady has her scar on the breast. And you can see there is some distortion just adjacent to the nipple. All of those things we tend to deal with with fat injection as a secondary procedure. And that's something we do. We do end up doing a fair number of secondary procedures related to implant-based reconstruction. But the only thing I will say to you about those procedures is they tend to be day procedures where you're in and have them done the whole same day. And this is just a similar thing where we can do a wise pattern where we reduce the skin pocket and then place the implant in the subcutaneous position with ADM over top of it. So Jamie was talking about patient reported outcomes, and that's what everybody wants to know. You know, we can think we're doing a great job. If you don't, it doesn't really matter. And interestingly, they looked at patient reported outcomes with regards to uh, implant based reconstruction in December 2021. And what they found was patients did found there was no difference in their patients' mean breast satisfaction. So they were as satisfied with their breast before they had surgery as they were after. That there was improvements in the patient's psychosocial well being. And again, they found no changes in their physical or sexual well-being. And this is a big change. These are on patients who have direct implant reconstruction. If we looked at tissue expanded reconstructions a number of years ago, we would have found that all of these measures would have been decreased and patients were not as happy with the overall breast. And so I think that direct implant reconstruction, the use of ADM has made a huge difference in patient satisfaction and what we're seeing. And we're definitely seeing better breasts now than we saw 10 to 15 years ago. Thank you. <laughs> Again, thanks a million, Katrina. Uh, um, and it just shows that there, like there's um, there's no rules. It's a it's a it's a patient based thing. Once they know all the the options that are available, so I think Eve is in charge then. Okay. And lunch is up on Yeah. So we have our second set of uh, patient presentations coming up now. I know I got to speak to some of you before the break. Hopefully, you're not surprised if I call your name now. Um, if you're not prepared, no. Um, and if you want to ask if you have an implant, I have a back surgery. How long did the implant last? Do you have to have further surgery? Yes. I think the general consensus is that if there's no change in the size and shape of your breast and you don't have any symptoms of pain, you leave well enough alone until the problem. That the general sensitive. Yeah. I think when I had my done, it was talk about 10 years. So there's, there's a loose set of rule of thumb that there's eight to 10 years, but really the attitude over here is unless it's a problem, a change in size and shape, or if you're experiencing pain or distortion, just need to be. That's it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, just want a testing thing. Sorry, they work when we don't want. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm um, going to get a DM, um, see her soon. To, it's hard to gauge. You get these, you meet your surgeon, and they say there's a 2% chance of this, there's an 8% chance of that, and all the things that could go wrong. What I really want to know is what. There seems to be a lot of complications. It's not as simple as you pop into hospital, you have your procedure, you go home again. It, it, you know, it's hard to get that sense of, but you know, you know, in my mind, I, you know, that that would be the ideal situation that you go in, you have a baby, you go home, you, 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 yeah. What is the chance of having a non-complicated so, procedure? So, and the other, the other question, which I think I don't know, just in general, people is, what is what is the situation now in Ireland in general around the delays in access? Because today is about access. I mean, there's a huge access problem in, and what is happening about that? Because I've been waiting. I, you know, I've been fortunate now that I've been able to get privately 
but like lots of people can't get it on privately. So what's the situation around access to it? So I can ask the first question. Yeah. So um, so for today, Press Reconstruction Awareness Day is about to stimulate thought and to educate patients. So we didn't pick all the best patients. We, we picked all the patients that would encourage a conversation. Um, if we just picked all the best patients and painted a, a rosy picture, I don't think that's the right, it's a, the right attitude or the right way to approach this. Um, so we wanted to give real life stories like implant based reconstruction. People have decided not to bother having a reconstruction because they've had a bad time because of infection. Just to give an overview, so this food thought that we're just not pushing everybody has to have a day of rest reconstruction, or everybody has to have a reconstruction. The majority of times it's seamless. I mean, most of the surgeries are like four or five hours. People stay in the hospital for matter for maybe four or five days. Well, I mean, they come in on a Wednesday, they come in on a Wednesday, they go home, or maybe they're Monday or Tuesday. And a lot of the time it's just simple dressings. Um, but there are complications that are associated. So instead of painting like this rainbow and sort of unicorns, instead of just so much to generate a conversation about what can go wrong in informed consent, then just having it on the side, like we can't have an infection. I don't know, it, it, the, the blind experience or as well, Yeah. Um, sorry, go ahead, John. So I, I would say I, I quote my, my, my own numbers to everyone. So the chance of it completely failing. For me, you're one in 200, but the chance of having some complication you're just going to have to see is a bump in the road. And definitely a lot of my patients will test this, like abdominal wound complications, is about one in two. So there's a relatively high risk of a small thing that's not going to change your outcome. But at the end of it, you look back in three years' time and you're going for life. And so, yes, there's a high rate of small complications. It's a very, it should be a very low rate of things going wrong. And, 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 and I mean, but yeah, it, 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 I just think it's failure. It might be a wound that needs addressing. Exactly. Yeah. So the one in two is four complications, well, and that's yeah. primarily yeah. made up of yeah. that's a primarily made up of little hiccups along the way, and there's so many aspects to it. There's just loads of opportunity for little things to go wrong, and you know you can speak to any of my patients that are here. Say I think most people, and of course. A lot of people don't tell me, they tell the breast care nurses, they go back to me. But a lot of them will say at the end it was well worth it. And I, I don't think anyone regrets how you've done it. I think it all works out for, for well in the end. But there's a bumpy road for lots of people at the start. Um, and I guess that's just the way it is. The, the access thing, it, it's hard. I mean, there's probably people doing high volume DFs in Ireland. You know, at least there are five of us. It, it's, it's not many of us. Um, access is poor. I mean, our, you know, when I started in Beaumont in 2019, I took on a load of long readers that were on the waiting lists, you know, three, four years, and they're all cleared. And then I had a really short waiting list because I'm, you know, so I don't like a dog trying to do as many as possible. And then COVID hit, and then we, you know, all, all, all these things have just not done this massive waiting list again, and it's back out to a year. And it's probably more than that now at this stage. Um, and then, you know, you touched on private, I think, you know, myself and there, Richard and Clara Healy are the only people just starting to do it in private hospitals. And while that's, uh, it's great for people, people with private health insurance, it actually also helps the public waiting list too, because it takes people off those lists. And also then there's the option for the public hospitals to buy space in the theater and in private hospitals. So I suspect that will start to improve things. Um, but that's really only in the last six months that the apps happened finally. And that's as things, you know, Linda says sorry. her hour was nine hours. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I was private and I've been waiting here. So, yeah. And I asked when mean, I saw for, yeah, um, when I saw him the first time, when he, so we did that, we discussed everything. And then he said to me, okay, I knew there was a book coming and he explained about the waiting list and all of that. And, okay, you take it, you understand. Um, and I asked him, would it make any difference, public versus private? He said, oh, I'm waiting. I saw him in October last year. I, I guess that is that is the issue. I mean, yeah, yeah we've only, I, I, as in January was my first private DF, and that will slowly, hopefully, alleviate the goal. I mean, at yeah. the end of the day, there's only very small cohorts of surgeons doing it. And, you know, it's it just, we're always pushing for more people, but there is a finite amount of time. We do so, I, I do sometimes two on the list, 
So that's very yeah, there's you know, um, easy gifts. But I think some hospitals are just not doing that. Yeah, yeah, it's a bit of a postcode, postcode monitoring. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> there you go. So, um, I think there's two issues here. One is, um, as surgeons, we are obliged to fully inform everyone of all complications, no matter how uh, small or insignificant they consider to be. So I think a possible way to look at it is we tell you there's a 3% chance of a good DNA problem or whatever it is. In my mind, I say, well, it means there's a 97% chance that it will work. So it's all about attitude. And I think the idea of this is that for all of the patients here, prospective or already done, is to understand that, yes, it can be a complicated journey, but ultimately we're there to get you through at the end of the day. And the vast majority of people works well. Um, and complications, we highlight them. I mean, I tell patients, you know, it's a if it's a delayed DM or a delayed whatever, I'll say, you know, this is an elective booked operation. There is a chance, as with any operation, it's very, very small, but you could die. People do die, it's incredibly rare inside of one of 10,000. And we say, oh, we're obliged to tell people the complication about elective operations for care. By far and away, the minority. And um, access is a huge problem, you know, and it's very exciting to start to do it in the private sector as well. But even getting access to private sector lists is a problem. I mean, let's talk to Jamie and say just once every two weeks, a half day list. Uh, so it's access, it's staffing levels, it's timing in theatre. It's a big problem. Um, and it's also a problem the UK was reporting the Guardian this morning saying that. Most people are waiting two or three years because of the pandemic year was here. I think we need to kind of promote awareness and understanding amongst patients and say, look, yes, there are complications, but we have the knowledge and the ability to deal with those, get it true. And the vast majority of people are okay. Actually, this is always going to be a problem. But I say to patients, look, you know, speak to your TD, speak to speak to any of the people in the hospital, and let them know it's a problem. 